É, pessoal, bom dia a todos. É, Bem-vindo a mais um colóquio do Instituto de Física de São Carlos. Tá, hoje a gente tem o prazer de receber a professora Laura Green. É, eu não vou fazer a apresentação da Laura, porque esse colóquio ele faz parte de um evento, tá, que é Ciência por Elas, organizada pelo SPY Student Chapter. Tá, então, por isso, eu vou chamar uma das organizadoras do evento, que é a Júlia Kassab, que faz, doutorando aqui do Grupo de Ótica, e ela vai apresentar a Laura. Eu só, é, só gostaria de... Agradecer vocês aí pela presença. Obrigado. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. I wanted to thank Laura for accepting the invitation to be here, and I especially want to thank the organization of the colloquium for allowing us to use the time and space of the colloquium to do this. Um, it's a great pleasure for the chapter to have Laura here. I have a lot of things to say about her. She graduated in physics from Ohio State University. She did her PhD in Cornell, and then she was a researcher at Bell Labs. She became a professor at the University of Illinois, and now she's a professor at Florida State University. She's also the chief scientist at the National High Field Magnetic Lab, or the National Mag Lab. She does, re she Her research is mainly on unconventional superconductors. I'm sorry, um, he wrote it. And I'm <laughs> yeah, as she said yesterday, you can Google her. Her Wikipedia page is amazing. Um, something else I wanted to say about her is that she was the president of the American Physical Society in 2017. Uh, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and she's won many awards, like the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Lawrence Award. Well, as I said, check her Wikipedia page, it's mind-blowing. Um, so once again, Laura, thank you for being here. I'm going to give you the mic now. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is uh, go on a vacation that neither my husband and I have had in more than a decade, and we chose to have it in Brazil because we love Brazil so much. So I've been here many, many times, but I always do these surgical strikes, and so I'm just really delighted to be here. And the other thing I tell all of my colleagues, that if you are invited to give a presentation in Brazil, just take it. <laughs> so. What I love is the enthusiasm, the warmness, and just the loving audiences that we have and that we work together. I love to get interrupted. I also would ask that when I start talking too quickly, you go like this, okay? I, yeah, that's fine with me. So um, thank you very much. Um, it's been really a great time here, and I think I'm going to go on to, yes, yeah, so basically that's how you can reach me. I'm starting to tweet again. But <laughs> So I want to start out by advertising something that I love coming to Brazil for, and that's the Meet the Editors uh, Conference workshop. And it's to help. I actually give lectures on this all over the world for something called Coach, which I'll tell you about in a second. But uh, it's trying to train people how to be successful in publishing in peer-reviewed journals. And it's, it, it's very useful. I love doing it, and it's very useful. And there's going to be another one that I'll be going to, and it'll be late October, early November in Capinas and Natal in 2019. Uh, Carlos Aguest doesn't have the date yet, so just keep emailing him and annoying him to find out when the next one's going to be. <laughs> okay. So here's a very informal outline. I'm much more comfortable giving a physics talk than doing one of these. You probably can't tell, but I'm shaking. <laughs> so um, bear with me. What I'm going to do is talk a little bit about, well, some of my personal journey. And then I want to br bring in some data. 
Um, and what I didn't add here, what I added this morning, is a reference to the new consensus report of the National Academies on sexual harassment in the workplace. And then what I want to do is just stop. And I did this in Campinas a couple of days ago. And we had a wonderful, lively discussion. And we all learned from each other. So I'd like to um, really go ahead on that. So um, I guess I have to start out with me. And that's what I have this for. <laughs> this is just some notes, just to remember. And uh, what time is it? It's 10.42. I don't want to go more than 10 minutes. I can add more at the end. OK, so you may have read my abstract. and. People, okay, I'm going to be 67 in a couple months. I have nothing to hide here. And um, people my age, older than me, a little younger than me, were never really encouraged to go into physics. So when I said in my abstract, which I've said before, it's not my job or my career. It's really a part of what I am. Um, I, I remember from a very, very young age, I had questions looking at the stars. You know, I didn't start out wanting to do superconductivity. Um, super, um, so, um, but you know, you get drawn into science because of the space program or looking at the stars or whatever. It doesn't matter what brings you in, but I got addicted and I call physics seductive and consuming. And, and that's just how I felt. I knew I would never ever get a job in physics. I knew it. I was told that from day one. Um, my, uh, my mother was very encouraging until I went to a fifth grade summer school in science and she came to see it once and I was the only girl and she didn't want me to stay in it. But I didn't even notice I was the only girl. So that was some of the things that happened. You, I think people my age had to put up barriers. And um, I've mentioned my husband is a musician and you don't go into music career unless you really have a calling. You don't become a priest unless you have a calling. You don't, at those days, you don't go into physics to make a lot of money or that you're sure of a job. It's probably, it's gonna slow you down another career path and you do it if you have a calling. So that's pretty much what I did. Um, so, uh, in a, so in elementary school, I read all of the books on science and they ran out and then they gave me, okay, honey, take this other book in, uh, in Mrs. Piggle Wiggle, which I liked. But I, uh, what, what I think happened is I was really discouraged. And I still remember, I mean, I loved math. I loved math puzzles. Um, in, I, think, was it seven, I was about 14 years old, and I was taking a math class. And I still remember the problem. So I pretty much did it in my head, and I wrote down the answer. And I was failed in that course because it was assumed that I couldn't do that, and I must have been cheating, right? So, you know, these things happen and you can only fight so much and you just continue going and you, I didn't really put up much arguments at all. This is going to keep going out. Okay, I'm going to have to remind myself. Um, but I, I pers persevered and in high school what I did was music. That's what I did all the time. I sang, I played guitar, I had three or four performances a week. I was in synagogue choirs, church choirs, high school choir, uh, rock bands, folk bands. When the moon is in the sun, never mind. Um, so, yeah, I'm that old. Okay, and, uh, but I, I did terrible in high school. So I went to Ohio State. I was raised in Ohio because they took everybody and they expected to flunk you out. And then I got involved, well, it, let me tell you a little bit what happened was I got to Ohio State and my mother didn't want me to major in science and I didn't know what it meant to major in science. My parents were immigrants they weren't educated. My father was a salesman, wonderful people, but you know, we didn't you know, know that much about science, et cetera. My mother wanted to educate her daughters. That was tradition in our family. So they sent me to Ohio State to be an elementary school teacher. Uh, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not, I have a lot of kids, but I'm not that crazy about kids. So, um, so I was in the physics building at Ohio State Oh, I went to the engineering college because I had no idea what engineering was. And I said, what is engineering? Can I major in this? Uh, is that like science? And they said, honey, don't bother. When you get your degree, they're going to ask you if you can type. This was 1970. This was pre-women's lib. It was completely legal to say, we don't hire women. Or just behind the scenes say, we don't hire blacks, we don't hire Jews, okay? That was pretty common in those days. And if you've ever seen the show Mad Men, 
on TV that's sort of related. I'm the age of the daughter. <laughs> okay, I forget her name, Beth or something, I forget. Um, so, uh, so then I was taking one of these horrible non-calculus-based physics classes. I've taught a lot of physics classes, and I don't mind teaching the general how do things work course or, you know, thermodynamics. I love those things, but the one that I really hate is the non-calculus-based physics courses because it's pre-med majors and they want to, like, kill each other for a grade. So, anyhow. So I was taking that course, and I, I've, I enjoyed it, actually, taking it. It's better than teaching it. And I was walking through the physics building, and you know how something really bad or really good happens to you and it's burned in your brain, okay? If I had to tell you exactly what year it was, exactly what date, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't, except I knew I was at Ohio State. I probably couldn't even remember that. But I remember, I can see it now, a sign that said, physics majors, fill out one of these forms. Ta-da! Okay, so, um, so I just said, oh, wow. So I filled out one of the forms and I gave it to the receptionist and she walked me back to meet the chairman of the department. Hi, <laughs> nice to meet you. You know, and it had a profound effect on me because I'd walked around the physics building and I'd seen posters. And uh, the other thing that happened was um, I got into this, I didn't have enough background to take calculus. So they put me in an accelerated trigonometry class and I got this is when the ADHD helps, right? I would sit down and start working problems, and I'd never had so much fun. It just transcended me to another planet, like musical do to you. I was just gone. And my girlfriend, Arlene, would kick me at the, and where we were studying. She'd say, Laura, you haven't put your pen down for four and a half hours, you know. So, you know, I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and so I was in this class. I filled out this form. I caught, this is an interesting story, too. Um, I called my mother. That night, and I said, Mom, I want to tell you, I've decided to become a physics major. And her answer was, by the way, this has a good ending. Her answer was, and she was, even though she didn't have a lot of education, she did a lot of reading. She liked to go take, you know, courses at the local college. She said, quote, honey, I can't support you then. We can't afford to breed educated women. And it was, you know, she, I'm worried you won't find a husband, and you won't find a job. Okay, she had a point there. <laughs> I got married the first time at 37, so I never thought I'd get married. Um, and so, um, yeah, surrounding yourself by a bunch of physicists isn't really the best dating service. Uh, so, um, so uh, you know, I was a little upset, but I went out and got some scholarship help, and I got jobs, and I pretty much... What you can do in those days, because college was affordable, I worked my way through college. But I have to say she did change her mind. Um, and she tells me a story which I actually don't remember very well, which is when she changed her mind and became incredibly supportive, was when she, I took the bus from Columbus, Ohio to Cleveland, where my family lived, and she picked me up at the bus station, and she asked me how it was going, and I burst into tears. And she goes, honey, why are you crying? And my answer was, I know I want to do physics, but I can't decide what kind of physics. <laughs> and, and it's true, right? I mean, you start taking these courses, and you're a kid in the candy store. High energy, nuclear, bio, condensed matter, quantum electrons, semiconductors. It's all like, yum. You know, so it's just, you, you really don't know where to go next. So I did get my degree in, in Ohio State, and I'm going to keep looking at this. Um, and... I, did, I was afraid to go to, to, to graduate school, just scared. I didn't have the confidence. The other thing I want to say is I think on a whole, you know, we know different people learn differently. I think men learn a little differently than women, depending on your background, depending where you are on the spectrum. That's my favorite word now. It's this Asperger's, you know, that it's being studied all the time now. All physicists have it to some degree. Uh, I think I'm getting worse. Um, so, uh, you know, we all learn differently. And to me, I found out that I would, be, I would be slow to catch on to a problem, okay? But then when I got it, it was, as my thesis advisor would say, in the belly. You know, you really had it. So when I really, I remember lost, I didn't understand second quantization. I couldn't follow it. And then I had a dream about it. And it kind of gelled, okay? I, the dream's weird, but I, never mind. Um, so... Uh, 
so anyhow, I uh, also had a physics professor. These d deviating paths, when parents tell me or students tell me that there's deviating paths, you know, it's all, it all adds to it. So one of my professors in nuclear physics who taught E&M, Professor Phil Jastrom, was an amazing professor. But he also deeply believed in parapsychology, you know, reading people's minds, moving matter, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, hmm, maybe this is an area I could go into. So I wrote J.B. Ryan and Louisa E. Ryan. These are people that coined the term parapsychology. They worked at Duke University. Uh, then they moved out of Duke University and made their own institute on parapsychology. Uh, and they did studies and they, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I went down there. I got a job to work there for a summer. I bought a car for $50. <laughs> I sold it. This was a long time ago. And uh, anyhow, so um, I did a lot of studies there. And uh, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. And I did a lot of experiments. And I can tell you about them. And I was getting to convince myself. I even lectured on it at Caltech because I was part of an exhibit. We put an exhibit together called Sci Search about what was going on in parapsychology. And I went to conferences. I even lectured at Caltech and had a discussion with Richard Feynman about it because Dick Feynman actually was kind of interested in this. And as that year went on, and I was convinced that Stanford Research Institute figured out several of these things, something called remote viewing and working with Uri Geller, it was the great Randy, okay, a, a magician who I got to know well that showed us it was all tricks. Not just tricks, it was something that's important to science. This was a real learning experience. There were there was two kinds of things going on here, and this happens in science. One thing is that people were fooling themselves. They wanted to believe it so much, they were making statistical errors, not because they were stupid or evil, but they parked their scientific method at the door. In physics, Ernst Langmuir called that pathological science, okay? That N-rays, the guys that thought that they saw N-rays, weren't lying. They just made a mistake in their scientific method. I do a lot of studies in this, by the way. I think it's really interesting. Um, this helped me, getting lost in parapsychology helped me understand that. Um, so uh, we know how to defend that as scientists because we have peer review, we give talks, and we try to ask each other, et cetera, et cetera. But there's another end of the, I'll call it the spectrum, but it's not the same spectrum, which is direct fraud. So the director of the Institute for Parapsychology, just before I got there, was fired because he was caught they put electrodes in, in, um, in mice that they're supposed to choose a number to get food. I don't remember what it was, but it was some kind of thing. Could the mice do this? And he was caught touching the electrodes together to get more data, complete fraud, because he knew he was right and he needed the funding. There's several examples of that in physics. There was the Shun case. There was, um, what was the other case? Um, the guy who, uh, element 118 and 116, I'll remember. Um, but it does happen where people are caught doing fraud. And so I've studied this a lot now, and it's, it's something I'm very interested in, that I found that in science, you want to be keep the evidence base as much as possible. And it's very hard to do that. And physicists have very little defense against direct fraud because we're so trusting. And that was a big learning experience for me, that the great Randy was able to find these tricks that Uri Geller did and find all these problems. And the physicists at Stanford Research Institute were completely fooled. So it's a, all these things are learning experiences. So then I, I got the job. I was afraid to go to graduate school. So I went into aerospace. I got a job in aerospace. It was huge air crash. I'm sorry, Hughes Aircraft Company. And so I went over to, it wasn't basic research. I only had a bachelor's degree. It was working on what was a problem with their traveling wave tubes. So these are microwave amplifiers that go up in airplanes or go up in satellites that help transmit cell phone signals. They're used for reconnaissance. They're used for defense, or should I say offense, et cetera, et cetera. But I just worked. There was a problem with these things. And they didn't want to give me resources, and I had to demand resources. And I got these resources. By the way, working in industry in 1974 as a woman was pretty interesting. <laughs> so um, anyhow, uh, and this, again, this wasn't a research plant. This was, you know, a production plant, and, you know, so it was, it was very interesting. I have great stories. Um, and by the way, you, you make, 
my best defense, which is not the best defense for young people nowadays, because I didn't have a choice to argue with it. So I always made jokes about it, you know. When I would assert myself and someone would say, that frustrated blank, what she needs is a good blank, I would <laughs> mutter under my breath, that might be true, but at least I got the work done. So you, you just have to, you know, so um, I really enjoyed the time there. Um, the two funny stories was, um, and, and they didn't bother me that much because I wasn't worried about publications. I found out that I was getting these things done and I actually figured out one of the problems. I built a test station, I did, did a lot of reading, et cetera, et cetera, and all the stuff. And I was writing these cathode reports bi-monthly. And I found out that my boss, since he was the boss, did this to everybody, would take my name off the paper and, and it put his name on it, the report, and I wasn't even, even invited to the meetings. The, so that was one of the, I don't think it's because I was a woman, but it could have been, I don't know. But, you know, that said, I really want this PhD. Um, the other thing that I, why I wanted the PhD is I wouldn't get the interesting questions. They would go to the guy with the PhD back there, right? And I wanted to really get the interesting questions. And, and I missed it. I liked what I was doing. I loved the design. I liked, I learned engineering drawing. But I decided then to go back to graduate school. Not knowing where to go, not coming from an educated family, I just went back to Ohio State. And I had a wonderful advisor there, and that's when I decided to go into condensed matter physics. Um, let, let me give you another thing that I learned was that, and I use it with, and whenever a student comes to me, I just told my advisor, my undergraduate advisor, who was still at Ohio State, who, by the way, known him since 1970, he's still a mentor, which is really wonderful. Um, so um, I said, how do I choose? You know, I love high energy, you know. This is what I was telling you before. And he goes, go and talk to the groups and see who you get along with. And I said, what? Aren't you supposed to be driven by the physics? And he goes, no. People that do materials physics have a different personality than high energy physics, theory or experiment. And just go talk to the people and see where you're more comfortable. And I realized I'm a quantum materials person or just you know, a complicated materials person. And so that's how I got working with David Tanner, who is also still a friend and a mentor, um, who said to me, you know, Laura, you're really too good to stay at Ohio State. I think, it's for me. <laughs> it's, it's okay, it's the 21st century. Um, so, uh, so I decided to apply to some places. And I applied to some places as a transfer student. Um, one of the places I applied to was Cornell. And I got this nice letter back from Cornell saying, we're impressed with everything you've done. I had even had publications and been to meetings giving talks by then, by a second year graduate student. And, uh, and they said, John Reppy uh, said to me, but you know, we're not accepting transfer students this year. We have too many people. So I talked to my friend Steve Aretti, who decided to go into high energy physics, and I said, Steve, help me out here. So in the middle of the winter, <laughs> driving from Columbus, Ohio to Ithaca, New York, we just drove to Cornell. I, I needed someone to help me drive through the snow. We took turns driving. I went to go see John Reppy, and I said, Dr. Reppy, I just want to tell you why I want to be here, and this is how much it means to me. And I gave him the facts and figures of why I wanted to work with Al Sievers and some other people that were there. And I still remember, you know, these things you're very good. Does anybody know John Reppy? He's always doing this. He's got long hair, you know. And, uh, and I drove back, and by the time I got back, there was a, a note on the answering that said, you're, you're accepted. So I changed. And so that's one of the things is that, one of the things that I've learned is that go for things. Let people know that you're interested. Don't argue, don't yell, don't scream, or scream. Just let them know the positive reasons. And why, and what I convinced them that my being at Cornell was good for Cornell, that I was bringing in my diverse ideas of what I've learned from Hughes Aircraft, from you know, Ohio State and different places, and why that information, what I've learned, will help Al Sievers' group. So it was great, and I had a great time in graduate school. It was very intense. One of the things I loved about Cornell is, um, I mean, it was very high powered, and the graduate students really were supportive of each other. Um, there was almost or about 300 graduate students and four women. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, I just said, oh, there's, you know, there weren't women at Ohio State. I said, this is great. You know, so we started having lunch together every other week. And then this was, the people in Campinas really resonated with this. Professor Katz went to one of us, Patty Sparks, Patty Drazel then, now she's Patty Sparks, and said, Patty, what is it that you gals talk about? And Patty said, we talk about physics. <laughs> we did. We talked about physics. Maybe we talk about you're tired or, you know, or something happens, but we basically talked about physics. We did not talk about harassment. We did not talk about sexual misconduct. We talked about if we were dating somebody, maybe. But, God, it would be nice. I was too busy in graduate school. You know, I always said that if 5% of the stories about me were true in graduate school, I would have had a much better time in graduate school. But um, anyhow, so we didn't talk about that. But we did start when that was like a key. And Patty said, let's get together. Let's start doing this. Let's, you know, we're, it's reasonable to do this. We've got a group of people who are alike. Let's start having lunches together every other week. And we opened it up to postdocs, undergraduates, chemistry, material science, engineering, and it grew to a fair, fairly large group. And what we did, and this was, when I look back at it, I didn't realize how important it was for me at the time. What we did was we'd either bring lunches or, you know, pass a ditch or something like that, and we would take turns giving talks. So sometimes we would talk about a physics problem, our research, a recipe, uh, gypsy moths. It didn't matter just you're standing up in front of a friendly audience and practicing. And it was great. It was really wonderful. And, you know, one of them, we'd have to say, you know, that was interesting, but maybe you should, reminds me, but I have to, you know, she was terrible at giving talks, and now she's okay. She's got a great job. But I now have to talk to um, the young women and say, well, you know, um, some of my personal journey was uh, an overview of some programs from some women in science and society, you know. So now I have to work with young women and make sure they give better talks. That's part of the training. But um, what happened is I ran into Patty about three years ago or four years ago, and in, 19, in, in 2017, I had no idea that group was still going on. I just didn't know. It had been going on, and we had a 40-year reunion. And I, I just thought, I just, wow, this was so cool, and we had a great time. Um, and I, I, I think that really helped. Uh, the women in Campinas actually have a group now, and the younger people are saying that it helps. Uh, what I like to say about getting my PhD, I got through because of my girlfriends and my gumption. It wasn't easy. My thesis advisor, we get along great now, he had never really seen a woman in, his, in physics, let alone his lab. You know, he'd seen them maybe from a distance. Cornell was really behind as far as diversity. They still had rules about, you know, women and men being married, and, you know, there was all kinds of problems, you know, into the late 60s. So it was really behind the times as far as diversity goes. And it was a, it was a different kind of uh, sexism where he wanted to look like he was supportive, but he just didn't trust it. And he would look for errors, and it was very difficult. And I went through, um, um, uh, I went through a very difficult time with him because he sat down with me about a year before I graduated and said, he looked at physics as his temple, you know, and he was, you know, one of the people that prayed in this temple. It was his whole life, more than his family or anything, which is what some scientists do. Um, and he sat down with me and he goes, you know, Laura, I cannot recommend you for a job in physics. You're just not good enough. And of course, I went really depressed, you know. And uh, so I'm applying for places that he would support me in oil companies. And I have to say, I actually do like industry. But I, I really, at that point, I really wanted to pursue something that had a research element in it. Um, so, but anyhow, I said, well, I wasn't, what I always said, I was in physics this long. Every day was great. If I have to leave now, I got in a lot longer than I ever thought I'd be in. Okay, so low expectations. Um, so the Bell, the Bell Lab, this is another thing that I, I like to tell the story because it helps you reach into, you know, run into problems, not just because of diversity, but any kind of problems, to remembering a time when you overcame the problem is really useful. So the night I signed up for an interview and uh, 
I, it was just silly. I thought that he wouldn't know about it. But before I went home that night, he comes to my desk, and there's me and my office partner in the, in the room, and uh, Al basically tells me, and I remember these exact words, that he's going to make sure I never get a job at Bell Labs. What? He's going to make sure. Oh, like when you see. Um, he's going to make sure that I never get a job at Bell Laboratories. And so uh, he walks out of the room. I do my usual burst into tears. <laughs> and my office partner, um, Bob Koch, sort of like he's, his jaw fell so far that he was like looking on the floor to find his jaw, you know. And so uh, one of my friends at the low temperature group knew this happened. And he came by and asked me how I was. And he actually, I didn't live that far, but he drove me home. I was really upset. And I thought about it. And I said, I'm not giving up. I just, there was nothing to lose, right? <laughs> if you have nothing to lose, why should you give up? So I, you know, I kind of cleaned up my face, and in my mind, I imagined myself sharpening my teeth. So I had an 8 a.m. interview, and I walked in with Venki, Dave Bishop, and Doug Asheroff, and uh, um, still, I saw Dave last week. Um, I'm still friends with these guys. And I just said, I know you talked to my thesis advisor. I would like to continue with this interview. Uh, you can ask me anything you wish. And please, I've collaborated with this person at this school, this person at this school, that person at that school. I had several, I'd established several collaborations. And I also have work that my thesis advisor isn't even aware of. So um, let's continue with the interview. And please take in this extra data. And I finally got the job. So I got a postdoc at Bell Labs, and it was an interesting year because it was very hard. It was when they were divesting. And I went to my friend Marilyn, and I said, I'm, and she said to me, if you take that job, your life will be hell until you graduate. And I said, yes. And so this is another thing about harassment, OK? And I can't say, again, my mother was trying to help me, and my thesis advisor didn't understand what he was doing. He, he really wasn't trying to hurt me, but he was, OK? But Marilyn said to me, you realize that right now, the most important man in your life is your thesis advisor. The most important person in my life is my thesis advisor. Yes. So I said, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to Bell Labs. And if he makes me clean toilets for the next six months, I'll clean toilets. Now, today, that's not the attitude. So you don't, I think it's better today. I really think it's much better. But I'm just telling you that. And now, when I've run into problems, when I've run into difficulties, I think back at that and how I overcame that, OK? And so, so what I want you to do is think about some time in your history where a family thing, a friend thing, a professional thing, you ran into a barrier and you overcame it. You got through it. Maybe not overcome it. Maybe not get over it, but you got through it, right? Tragedies you don't overcome, you get through them. Um, so you think about that, and you do have that bit of inner strength to get through those, and that really helps me a lot. That's also in graduate school, where I got involved with Amnesty International. My family has always been involved in human rights, and Kurt Gottfried, who wrote the book on quantum mechanics and two years ago won a bunch of human rights awards, he started Union of Concerned Scientists. He knew I had some interest in it, and he said, Laura, We've gotten a prisoner in Argentina out of the right of option, late 70s, early 80s, I can't remember the year, Elena Sevilla, um, would you be her mentor? Because she can't be out of jail in Argentina, but she's allowed to come to the United States. I said, hell yes. <laughs> so uh, Kurt and his wife and I drove to the Ithaca airport. Elena comes out of the plane with her two-year-old son, and she'd been in jail for two years. And so. I was glad to help her out. I learned a lot about Argentina, South America, a lot about Amnesty International. It was like the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned how much fun it was to have parties with a bunch of Argentinians where you make empanadas with the kids running around all night as opposed to American dinners, which are no kids, please. OK, I like those too. Um, so so that, that was really interesting to me. So I learned a lot. And then I got my PhD and went to Bell Labs. Going along in the story, I guess I'm, am I talking too much? Um, so this is another thing. Um, at Bell Labs, high TC hit. And I was in the right place at the right time. 
Um, we actually had split off from Bell Labs. We were in Bell Court, but those are details. Um, it wasn't a friendly workplace. I mean, my lab uh, at Belcourt was very friendly, but when you went to conferences and you were arguing about what was going on with the oxygen, did this a new material, you had to know everything and you had to be really tough and there were battles out there. And often, and sometimes people were attacking you personally, right? You know, and you'd have to say what I said in my workshop yesterday, it's business, it's business, it's business. It's nothing personal. Especially the Russians, they're like, oh, you're ugly. Okay, fine. Um, so I, was, I found that reaching back into, you know, getting through things in graduate school, I'd remember those things. They'd help me out a lot. But um, I also want to say that, um, that when you become more and more famous, okay, you do run into problems. Okay, uh, my husband has run into problems because he's a well-known pianist. Um, but if you're, a, I just want to tell you right now, I already told you my age, I don't have to repeat it, but one of the things I've learned and I've brought up with something when I show you the National Academy report is that when you're highly accoladed, talk too much, I'll just say, um, um, uh, you know, powerful, and for academia, I'm well paid, and you know, so, some, you know, when you reach the higher levels of academia, even in stage schools, you can get decent money. Um, women in physics, and frankly, any underrepresented minority in physics, and it's also it's, it's also true for thank you. It's also true for um, other areas, but I know physics better. Um, you can be seriously harassed in a way that doesn't look like sexual harassment, and like I said. When I, people said stories about me in graduate school, this stuff still happens now, only now there's the World Wide Web. So what happens to my husband and to me and to people I know, things go on the web that just aren't true. And, you know, not only did I decide not to do Facebook again after the Pittsburgh tragedy, but after the horrific happenings of yesterday at Christ Church, I still think that those guys ought to go to jail. But anyhow, so that's, we don't need to go there. It's, we're all really sad and depressed about that tragedy. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, before, so I didn't really do a lot of outside stuff. I was a lab rat uh, giving talks, but I was on the bench until I went to graduate, until I went, became a professor. Then I had to worry about students. So I got more and more involved in diversity. So it was more like teaching big classes, being supportive. And then I got involved in more diversity stuff through the American Physical Society. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. About 15 years ago, um, I got involved with the COACH program, which is giving uh, you know, workshops all over the world on the empowerment of women in science. This was started in 1994 by Professor Geraldine Richmond from University of Oregon, she would do this for chemists at American Chemical, American Chemical Society meetings. She came to me about 15 years ago because she knew I liked to do these kind of workshops on publishing and some other, and, and I taught this kind of stuff. And she goes, will you join my coach team? And we've been all over the world, Indonesia, you know, North Africa, everywhere. And it's been fantastic. One of the reasons I wanted to do this was, and one of the reasons my whole theme as president of the American Physical Society was um, science diplomacy and its application to human rights was because of what I've learned through these travels. So science diplomacy is using science to build a better world without worrying about borders and boundaries, basically. There's different definitions. And so what happened to me many years ago, when was, was it 2005, there was an IUPAP Women in Physics Conference in Rio de Janeiro, okay? And, um, and I'm with all these women, and IUPAP is the International Union for Pure and Applied Physicists. I'm a vice president, and I'm chair of my commission. The organization doesn't have much teeth, but what it does is great. So they're doing all these things for, for different working groups. This was the working group for women in physics. So I was asked to be a delegate, and I go there, and like I said, I'm a Jewish girl from the east side of Cleveland, and there are these hijab-shrouded women there. And I thought, can I talk to them? You know, I'd never seen that before. 
So I started talking to them, and we talked about physics. Then we talked more about physics. Then we talked about physics funding and how terrible it was in Albania to get funded. And then you start talking a little more. And before you know it, you mention that, you know, your kids are a pain in the butt and your husband doesn't help you enough, right? And so you get past it. You get past if someone is missing an eye. When you first see that, it bothers you. But when you start talking, you lose it. And so what I've learned in this going all over the world is that it's just science diplomacy, and it's really important. And what I find when I give these workshops all over the world, Indonesia, Morocco, Ghana, um, <laughs> Chicago, <laughs> that's a good one, uh, uh, that I, I, I'm a little selfish because I think I learn more from the group I'm talking to than they learn from me. You know, they learn little bits, et cetera, but I carry this stuff all over the world, and it's been just really, really marvelous. I think I can, oh, and then the last thing I want to say about science diplomacy, uh, oh yeah, why, um, I want to say two things about that. I mentioned the science diplomacy, oh, and also that what I mentioned earlier, that there have been studies that show that science works better, it progresses faster, with a, d a diverse group working on it. An example of that is the science diplomacy done by David Pines and some other people from the US National Academies that during the Cold War, when we had thousands and thousands of nuclear bombs, as did the Soviets, and these guys made meetings between the Soviet scientists and the US scientists. And not only was that fantastic for science diplomacy and getting to Glatznost, okay, but it changed the face of theoretical physics. Having just the diversity of white guys, Soviet, and white guys, US, in my field of superconductivity and correlated electrons had a profound effect. So diversity is important. Um, so um, why don't I go on in some of this? Now I can project. A I'm going to close this and go into some other things. <laughs> and I'll try to do this now. OK, sorry. Um, OK. So I'm going to go, go over some of these things. So should I stop at 11.30, 11? So he says, stop at 11.30. Julia says, go on until Tuesday. OK. I, I have 600 slides here, so we're good. OK, 10 minutes until 11.45. But I want more than 10 minutes for questions, so I'll go past these a little bit quickly. So you don't have to memorize all this stuff, but if you look at for the IUPAP International Conference for Women in Physics, the proceedings, they have these numbers. So this is the latest one. And we see that the women in physics really drop out. This is new data, by the way. Really drop out between high school and college. We don't know why. Um, the, I could not find the info. We talked about this last night, Carlos, with Maria. I don't have the data for Brazil. I can't find it. So the percentage of undergraduate degrees in different countries. Okay. Now, when I go to Muslim countries, I didn't go to Iran last year because the US State Department forbade me to go. It's an interesting so read my back page. Um, but I found in you know, Oman, Morocco, Tunisia, and some of these places, the, uh, the Muslim countries, the women there, when I go there, they tell me they don't feel they have a problem in the workplace. They feel they're respected in the workplace. And the numbers kind of bear this out. Look at Albania and Iran. Now, I will tell you another thing about India. The women do have a problem in the workplace. It's a highly sexist society. But the women that are there are just amazing. And it's, sometimes it's depressing to go to India to see what they have to deal with. I mean, it, it's certainly it's hard in the US. And I'm, I'm sure it's hard here. But it's really hard in India. And these women are all heroes. But you can see it's not that high in the USA. We don't know why. We have guesses. Now, I just want to tell you that if you want to go online, the American Physical Society, and all of you can do it, and uh, you can find out about many of these uh, programs that the American Physical Society has for women. And there's several, uh, like Women Physicists of the Month, and there's a lot of workshops, et cetera. One thing that is really, really exciting is this, um, APS started working with this in 2012, the Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics. So um, there, it's now grown 
to 13 sites. So if you want to go, those are the sites. You can look this up, aps.org.qwip, and see where the sites are. I think you should, department chairs, I think you should consider applying for funding or getting funding to send a few women there. The, these data are a little bit old. I don't have the ones for 2018. But you can see that the attendance of these things is amazing. So it was 1,400 uh, for 2017. We, I don't have the numbers for 2018 and 2019. I don't know why I don't, but I don't. But they're the most wonderful conferences where you learn all kinds of skills and you network. And that's really, really important. So think about going there and, okay. Another thing that I keep getting asked about is that the American Physical Society has programs for LGBTQ, which is, an, is it's all related. Human rights, harassment, you know, et cetera, this is all related. And I was very proud when the United States, some of the states had these bathroom rules, remember? And so the APS pulled their conferences out of those, um, out of those states because as a membership organization, we have to keep our members safe. And so I was very proud of the American Physical Society for doing that. Um, societies work against harassment, and every, almost every society now has a code of conduct. There's still no teeth in it, but we have a code of conduct. I'm on the board of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or the AAAS, and we recently went through council. Council just approved. Um, a revocation policy for AAAS fellows. I, it's, I know all the details. It's incredibly weak, okay? It's, it's not, but it's a first step. And basically, you can have your fellowship revoked if you're guilty of scientific misconduct. Why do I have it up with this other stuff here? What is happening, led by the American Geological Union and the American Physical Society is doing that now, is we're redefining academic misconduct. Traditional is fraud, misuse of public funds. Now, harassment and sexual misconduct are included in ethics statements now. So it's, it's all very interesting and changing. So I don't have time to talk about this. What I want to do is, now this is all online. Rachel Ivey is an amazing statistician and a really nice person at the, at the American Institute of Physics. The American Institute of Physics is a federation of societies of which APS is a member. So she's done all this great work in statistics. She's the one that showed, published several years ago, that women um, in physics, there's not one place where we lose them. That it was a continuously leaky pipeline from the very young to the very old. <laughs> okay. But things changed recently. And there's this new report. And this report was act actually just came out. I had, she sent me the slides earlier, but, but I just checked the website. The report is out now. And um, so in high school, OK, it's pretty good, OK? It's 50% about. Then all of a sudden, through the years, something changed. So the percent, and this is US, so I, I don't know what's going on in the world, but you know, the U.S. either leads or lags behind countries. So I'm sure there's some of this in all countries. But what we find is that the number is dropping. The number of PhDs is growing like crazy, okay? But the number of, of uh, women getting bachelor's degrees is, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Let me back up. That last statement was wrong, okay? The number of women getting PhDs, the percentage, is still growing. But that's going to change. Because what we've so found is that the number of women getting bachelor's degrees is not increasing very fast like it used to. But the number of men getting bachelor's degrees in science, or let's say the total number of people getting bachelor's degrees in physics has grown a lot. It's, we've seen it in a lot of our universities that the, ba the undergraduate programs are growing like crazy. But it turns out the women aren't growing as fast. And what that means then is that the percentage of women that are getting bachelor's degrees is getting lower. So that's going to go into the future. So the number of women in physics, the fraction, the number might go up, but the fraction is going down. And uh, that's the PhD. I don't know. All the, I forget what the dip was. 
anyhow. Um, and then you can see that if you look at all fields and biological sciences, it's not bad. It's over 50% in some areas of science. But in some areas like physics, look at this, physics and engineering. And then, you know, computer science went down, and Carlos has an argument about that. Um, I don't know why. I, we can talk about it. I have theories. But I don't know why. When you follow any direction, mathematical ability, et cetera, it, it doesn't work. So it's just very interesting. And here's another example. PhDs weren't, weren't by, um, where's physics? Physics, OK? And here's biological sciences. Um, I, is this my last slide? I can't tell. Oh, yeah, OK. So I want to end with recommending this report here. And uh, it's really, it's a, thank you, thank you. It's a, um, so this is a fantastic report. Uh, it's a consensus report. I just finished a decadal survey in materials research, and we had 24 scientists working 26 months. And a consensus report is you all have to agree on the findings and recommendations. Could you imagine getting 24 physicists agreeing to something that's this thick? No, OK. Anyhow, this, had, this was a consensus report, and it blew me out of the water. And everyone is focused on this now. And this is the line that I pulled out of the summary. The, in the academic workplace, the academic workplace has the second highest rate of sexual harassment at 58%. The military has the highest at 69%. So that tells me one thing. That tells me that harassment and sexual misconduct in academia has nothing to do with sex. It's all about power. H Henry Kissinger, what? No, they don't report. This was done over, why don't you read the port, report? There's tons of studies, OK? But let me just finish what this means to me, is that Henry Kissinger, who was an academic, once said about academia, and you probably know this, never have so many people fought so hard for so little, OK? The stakes are low. And so this is all about power, and that's what this tells me. Now, what's happening right now is people are starting to talk about it. There were times where we never said anything, and I feel guilty because I, it didn't help the women down the line. And I'm still probably not going to say much because um, it's not in my generation. But I'm very impressed with the young women that are coming out and talking about it, and things are changing. And I also want to say that um, I don't know why the numbers are still going down, are still low for women, but I want to end on a very, very positive note. I'm going to change the slide here. I can do this one. And a very, very positive note, which is in all the years I've been in physics, in all the institutions, all the women that I've met all over the world, okay, women that I was in direct competition with for the next material, the next physical review letter, the next invited talk, it has always been supportive. I have never found a queen bee. I have never found an alpha female in physics. And so I encourage you, all of you women, to Stay in physics if you can. Email, talk, you know, get to know the other women just because you have things in common. And when you run into difficult problems, what we used to do in person, and now we're too busy, we do it electronically. You go, oh, tell me your story. I'm sorry by email or whatever you guys use nowadays. And, and then, you know, give her a hug and then turn her around and push her right back on in the workforce, okay? So I recommend that. It's been a marvelous, it's, it's great, and thank you very much for your attention. I'd love to hear some questions. Okay, you have more comments? But... So what I want are questions, comments, Questions, comments, your stories, where you think are full, I, I am full of it, um, corrections. So let's hear from you. Come on, give me something here. You're all from Brazil. Um, I just want to say that we have prizes for whomever asks questions, okay? Yay! <laughs> it's a good idea. Your idea about talking, I, I work in a military place. 
where there are very few black people and very few women. Your idea about call them to talk, just to talk anything, they are not physicists, it's an engineer institute, but your idea about call them, talk about everything, because not only physics, they are not physics, but your idea about to meet, to talk, to have lunch together, as you did, is wonderful. I think I'm going to do it in my institute. I'd like to know what happened. <laughs> When I was in Campinas, they told me they were doing that, and then someone else said, that's because you told us to do that a few years ago. So. Hello. Um, my name is Luisa, and um, I study informational systems, and there's like two girls in my classroom. And I think it's like very hard for a girl to get into technologies and to believe you can do this sort of thing. But I think it's also very hard to keep studying it because I see that like I live with eight, eight women and four of them used to study uh, technology and they gave up because of the environment we're in. And I want to hear you talk about like how do you think we can change this? Like how, what are the ways we can support each other and make it more like acceptable? That's a really great question. Um, that's something I've really thought about a lot and uh, we need more input from young people like you. So certainly getting a network and now we have email and other things. I'm not going to recommend Facebook at all but we have ways to communicate on international scale. So I do these workshops in Ghana and I'm still in contact with some of these women and I can mentor, be supportive, and they could mentor me and be supportive of me. So that's an important thing. Keeping your connections, doing your networking is very, very important. Another thing is that in the US now, uh, you know, with this report on sexual harassment, you can bring this, uh, this book up. You know, th this specifically states in here and that it's not accepted to not have a friendly workplace environment, okay? It's specifically stated in this room. I'll go to here because this is too depressing. <laughs> um, so people are more, in the United States, in, in academic institutions, people are braver now about going to their department chair, and if the department chair doesn't listen, going beyond that and saying, this is happening. There's been major successes. One of the ones I like to mention was at MIT many years ago, Nancy Hopkins worked with, was, studied this, a bunch of women at MIT went to the provost and went to you know, their management and said, we don't have enough, we have, we're not getting our salaries raises like the men are, we don't have the lab space, we don't have um, the benefits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They weren't getting the same things and they said, go away, you're just screaming bitches. Um, so, um, so they got the data. That's very important. You, if you negotiate, you get the data. And they showed, in fact, their salaries were falling behind their colleagues for the kind of papers they published, et cetera. Their laboratories were smaller. All these things were true. Tons of data across MIT. Bob Bergino was the provost at the time. And he looked at this and he goes, oh my gosh, you're right. And he took huge amounts of funds and fixed it. It was very controversial at the time. And I think it's still controversial, right? We have some people say that they were just complaining and, you know, et cetera. But, the, you know, the Nan Nancy Hopkins show that, in fact, when that changed, the, the women's success really increased a lot. And so these are things that you can bring out. Now, wh what are we going to change in the workplace? We just need more women. And that's the hard part. How do we get more women into it? Uh, that's the most important thing. As was said to me, you know, at a faculty meeting, I look around here, you know, and I know who the excellent people are in my, in my department. And I know who the mediocre people are in my department. When I start seeing mediocre women in my department, I know we've accomplished something. So the bar, you know, people say, oh, as soon as a woman gets a degree, everybody wants her. No, the statistics don't bear that out. In my section of the, Net, of the American Academy, it's 10% women, 10%. So it's lower than average. In the, um, what was said to me by uh, Dick, uh, Dick Feynman's sister, sister who was, gave a talk uh, 
in his memory at the, one of the APS meetings, more women, oh, more neutrinos have won Nobel Prizes in physics than women have, okay? And in fact, if you randomly, if you just put everybody up in physics and did a Monte Carlo, you couldn't get a low number like that. So bringing that awareness to the front, coming up with these ideas, I think is really important, and networking. I don't know how to make it better. The American Physical Society, the AAAS, we have lots and lots of programs to help this out. But it's not working. So give me some ideas here. And, and if you want any mentoring and support, I'm there for you. We all are. But yeah, so we need better ideas. Gente, eu só queria falar, se alguém quiser fazer perguntas em português, a gente traduz, tá? Hi, I'm not confident enough to ask in English, so I'm asking in Portuguese, and I ask her to translate for me. É, para essas pessoas que, como seu mentor que fazia, que te fazia mal sem perceber, é, o que você fa falaria para essas pessoas perceberem é, o que estão realmente fazendo, sabe? Porque se muitas vezes eles não percebem, é difícil... É, o que você falaria para que essas pessoas realmente percebessem? Sim, para que a, a mudança viesse deles e não de outras pessoas. I was nodding, but I didn't understand any of it. So. I, I'm sure your English is significantly better than my Portuguese. So he was talking about, um, you mentioned your PhD advisor and how he was hurting you without noticing. And he was asking, what can we do? How can we show these people what they're doing and how can we change that? I think my thesis advisor actually, um, actually might understand that by now. Um, but it took a while. By the way, I didn't tell you that one person who helped me out through that was John Wilkins. Um, that, you know, I was really miserable. And, uh, and, you know, when I finally got my PhD, which I, you know, I had to finally rise up and say, you're going to sign it now or you're going to be sorry. You know, I finally had to, you know, get, you know. And John told me that, you know, I started out being afraid of Al. By the time I graduated, Al was afraid of me. So um, that was really true. Um, so how do you do this? I think um, what you do is, which I talked about in some of these other workshops, and some of these management skills are good for students too, which is you have a conversation. You sit down. What I should have done, should have, would have, could have, but I didn't know anything, and I was a scared rabbit in those days, and a minority, and, you know, what I should have done was sit down at the table with him and, and say, you know, if he says, we're going to make sure you never get a job in physics, well, that was too big of a blow to respond. So what you do is you, res you, you have a pause. This is what I should have done. <laughs> you have a pause, and I felt very, very emotional. So you can't stay there. And you say, thank you very much. I need to go and think about this. I'll get back to you. And then you get the data. So you go back and you show him the experiments that you did. I mean, it ta we, we lose sight of this. I love writing merit reviews because by the time the end of the year comes, I think I haven't done anything and I did this badly and I spread myself too thin. And then I have to write my accomplishments and I feel better. So do something for yourself. Sit down and write down your accomplishments, okay? And maybe you can talk to someone else and get a quote from someone that said, you know, you know, Carlos or someone did a great job in this data analysis and helped me in my experiment. That, you know, he taught me how to run this machine. So get the data. Not overwhelming, just the really important points. And then go back and say, Mr. Professor or Mrs. Pro whatever it is, Professor, um, I'd like to discuss this with you again, that I would like to, cons I still want to consider uh, to get a job as a postdoc in physics or a real job in physics. So I have these data here, and I'd like to discuss these with you. And then he'll say, no, you're gone. You know, that's a possibility. Um, and then you might come back with more data, or you might give up. This whole, you know, you have to figure out how to negotiate. Or he'll say, let me think about this. You know, and you might open the door, so maybe it's not physics. You know, you just have to put things on the table. I don't want to talk too long. 
but um, I did nothing except work behind his back with the Bell Labs people, okay? Um, that is one negotiation style. Nowadays, I would collaborate with him and say, I'm this good, and when your PhD student is this successful, you will look good. And in fact, I was worried he wasn't, when I was looking for jobs, when I was done with my postdoc at Bell Labs, I was looking for jobs. I had got a job at Bell Labs, that was great. And Al found out I was looking for jobs and I wasn't asking him for a recommendation. And he calls me up and goes, are you crazy? You were my student, you have to ask for a recommendation. And I said, I'm worried about it. And he goes, I want you to succeed. You know, and he was very supportive. I, I got over that barrier, not by discussions with him. I think it could have been done better. So, um, so th that's sort of a skill of just put it on the table. So, I think there was a woman back there, too. Did you raise your hand? No? Oh, I thought you did. Sorry. Love the, uh, love the shirt. Thank you. <laughs> it's from the chapter. We're organizing the event. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> just uh, advertising. Um, thank you very much for coming and for your lecture. And pleasure. thank you for sharing your, your experience. You said that uh, when you think about when you're having a, a, beer, a barrier and you think of a time when, when you overcame it, uh, I think it also helps when you think of other people that inspired you and that overcame other barriers. It, it helps me a lot. So thank you for that. Oh. And um, I'd like to hear about your theories. You said you had theories about the numbers dropping, like Bachelor. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to hear about that. I'm sure everyone... Thank you for your yeah. question. Thank you for your very, very kind comments. I also want to say that um, what I said in, in, in one of the workshops yesterday is um, you get stronger from the bad things, but you really get stronger from the good things. So if you have a success, you really should celebrate. You really should sit back and say yes, okay? So those good things really build you uh, much more than the bad things. So theories, okay, so before this drop happened, I, you know, we're, we get all these questions, and Nora Barrow, who's at UConn now, said to me, um, oh, I figured it out. It's because men are such jerks. I said, well, that doesn't apply to every field, does it? I mean, it's not true in biomedical and, and no, male physicists are jerks, okay? So I thought about that, and I did come to some answer there, and men and women aren't the same, right? We want people to like us, um, we want to be helpful, we want to be successful, all those things, you know. Um, and the, the liking us and being supportive and being nurturing is probably a little more stronger in women than men. You know, I'm not going to say that men don't have it and all women have it, but, you know, there, there's a... There, there's some overlap, you know, it's not, um, so think about your first physics course. I, I hope it's better in Brazil, I hope it's better today. But they try to weed you out. They try to show you how stupid you are. They try to show you that if you want to stay in physics, you can't have a life, right? I went to one of my professors and I said, in, when I was taking courses at Ohio State in graduate school, I said, I'm handing in 70 to 100 pages of homework a week. I don't have a life. And he goes, if you want a life, get out of physics. And I, th I think that's, um, and my thesis advisor was like that. He did nothing else. Uh, so um, you can do other things. My best physics came after I had my kids. Um, you know, you, you need to do other things to be a well, you need the diversity of thought and mind, and you need the sleep to do better physics. So I think there's something to, also in physics, if you don't have a Nobel Prize by the time you're 27, forget it, right? So. This is just, I think it's non-conducive to a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of women, more women that are not comfortable with this. The later ones, you can see the women are growing more slowly than the men. We don't know why. Is it that women are going into other areas? The studies are happening now. They're going more into environmental science. That's one of the theories. The other theory is the Big Bang Theory. Okay, that, that you look at the Big Bang Theory and it's kind of cool, right? Yeah, I know the guy who, who's the scientific advisor, David Salzberg, and it's, you know, I started to watch it because I wanted to see if David made any errors. <laughs> you know? I couldn't find any, ever, you know, even in my field, and he's high energy. So, um, so, but if you look at that, 
Um, it really makes you interested in being a nerd. And it's very, you can buy this stuff from Shinova now. I wore my Gravity Wave one yesterday. Um, and so nerd clothing is popular. People are going into the sciences. And you see some of these ads like the superstar of science. You know, you see these ads all the time now. Um, and if the Big Bang Theory had an effect on that, I hate to say this, but look at the women in Big Bang Theory. So, and also look at the men, right? Sheldon is extreme on the spectrum. He does things that are inappropriate all the time. And I just, as a manager, I just went through another one of these management training things about the spectrum. And it occurred to me, one of the reasons why there's a lot of harassment in the workplace is because guys don't know they're doing it, right? They just don't know. They, it just doesn't, because they're, they're like this. Um, so th those are some of the theories. They're vague. I don't know the answer. But those are the things that we're kind of sharing. And um, I think if we can, you know, one of the things we have, if you look at the APS website, every month there's a woman in physics featured, OK? Read those. You know, just read them. It's just, oh, that's so great. Uh, she's doing great work, you know. And, you know, there's no, no negative stories. I was told years ago that don't just say you love that you've been so lucky. You need to tell some of the barriers you've gone over. And you know that everybody in physics, men, women, and every other gender has gone through barriers in physics uh, for all kinds of reasons. And so it might be a little harder if you're an underrepresented minority. It definitely is. But, you know, we've all done it, so let's, let's share our stories and try to work on this. Uh, hi, my hi. name is Anna, and hi. as you told us, um, when you got into the physics world, you had some kind of difficulties about the subjects. You couldn't, like, uh, get things so fast, and as... A, a woman with all the sexism, uh, with all the barriers that you had, how could you, how did you overcome all of these barriers? Like, did you go help, study more? What did you do? Oh, yeah. So, my, um, yeah, so like I said, I got through with gumption and girlfriends. You know, I just, I just didn't know how to say no, you know. I'm just a girl who can say no. Um, so, anyhow. Um, but I did work too hard. I still work too hard, although now I make sure I get enough sleep. <laughs> so I never got enough sleep for years and years. I'm sure it took years off of my life. But um, uh, I do work too hard. And this undergraduate advisor who I recently saw at the March meeting, you know, I, had, I was at the March meeting. I had just finished the Takeda survey. I was doing all this stuff in the next week. You know, not just here, but I was doing all this other stuff. And he says, why are you doing that? You know, you, your age, you should listen to the birds, you know. And, and he reminded me that he told me, um, it's this imposter syndrome, right? He reminded me that he said to me when I was an undergraduate, I think I have figured you out. People say, that Laura Green, she may not be very smart, but she works like a dog. You know, so I, that's not the right way to do it. But I just, I couldn't stop. You know, I just, I really loved it. And... Uh, my girlfriend, Marilyn, who I said, we both admit that we wouldn't have gotten to graduate school, through graduate school, without the other one. It's true. I just love her to death. And we're still in contact. I saw her twice last year. Um, she dedicated her thesis to two women, and one of them was me. I dedicated mine to my mother. She became extremely supportive. But um, I forget where I was going here. But uh, yeah, so she ran into enormous barriers enormous barriers. And you don't have to hear exactly what they were, but they were difficult. And she did it. And she's a top scientist working on, at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Very successful. And I don't know why, but when I look at people like Cherry Murray, I, I know more American, but there's, you know, and I would tell you, European women, etc. cetera, uh, there's a Brazilian woman in Sao, uh, Rio de Janeiro. And we share stories, not all of them, but some of them. And we just stay with it. And I don't know why. <laughs> I just wanted to do it. And I always said, every day in physics was a success. If I lost my job today, and I had to go sell shoes, because I really like shoes, um, uh, then I've had that much time, and I've been lucky. It's an attitude. I, I hope it's, I don't want it to be that hard for women, though. I want them, 
And we're seeing more and more that a woman will be encouraged to major into physics. So, okay. Are we, well, I saw, there's someone there? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Yuseo. I'd like to thank you for sharing your experience with us, your life experience. And my first question would be on the line of Clara's question about your theories. And I wanted to actually make a short uh, comment on this. And of course, I'd like to hear you about that. But I wanted to say that when you showed the numbers, you showed us and you said that um, it is not about sex, it's about power. And I think this, realizing this is so important because when you realize it is about power, you, break, you kind of break some of the arguments people have. Oh, it's not like this, or it's not exactly like this. And power and power relations is something that people understand. Every human being can understand power relations, no matter who you are, no matter what you are. So I wanted to thank you about bringing this up in, in this discussion. And of course, here, anything else you wanted to say about this? Um, well, the microphone gets handed to that other person. I will add one thing, OK? There's uh, a YouTube. I think it's called Bob is Dead. And so this guy is found murdered. And they say, what was he wearing? He really must have wanted to be. Why was he out at that time? Was he drinking? You know. And so. It's really interesting. And so when we started to work on this, I've been, okay, I didn't allow myself to think about this very much at all, it's, it's especially the harassment issues. I just didn't let myself think about it. That was my coping mechanism. But now, especially after this report came out, I'm thinking about it more, we're discussing it more. And uh, one of the problems of including harassment and sexual misconduct in scientific misconduct is that we still don't know how to adjudicate it. We, we're, and I'm an expert at adjudicating fraud, misuse of public funds. Every great institution knows how to adjudicate traditional scientific misconduct. This is difficult, okay? So I used to respond by, well, there's, you know, I say, okay, well, it has to be included because now if you talk about the ethics of author order, things like that, it becomes, it starts reaching into there and let's figure it out. Yes, it's complicated. We don't know how to deal with it, but let's figure it out. And then what happened to me is instead of saying how many people are accused and how many are falsely accused and the numbers are outrageous, I don't go there anymore. Okay? I say I've been falsely accused of many things in my life. Okay? Some of them were adjudicated. Some of them weren't. That's going to happen. What we have to do is include that in the, in the table. The trouble with that is, is that if you're in a parking lot and you went to go shopping or to a restaurant and you come back to your car and somebody whacked your car and you have a big dent in it, you put it all on the table. If somebody harasses somebody or is, does sexual misconduct on some, on some person, especially the women, okay, feel that they caused it. And that's not just with sexual misconduct, it's also with any kind of harassment. If someone punches you, if you get cut, and I, I can tell you about my girlfriends, what did I do to bring this on? Until we can recognize that the victim isn't the cause, we've got a long way to go. If we could say, that person grabbed me, that person punched me, and not feel, my husband punched me, and not, not feel guilty, then we've made a step forward. I think we're a long way from that, but that's where I want to go, where if someone is a victim, they don't blame themselves. Guys, we're running out of time. Uh, we're going to have a few more questions. But before you all leave, I just wanted to say Lara's going to be here this afternoon for the roundtable. So if you have more questions, please come back in the afternoon. There are going to be more people here. We're going to continue the discussion, OK? And I'll be around after lunch before, too. I'm just going to hang out. <laughs> Got a bunch of fun people here to hang out with. <laughs> hey. Hi. Uh, thank you. It's been amazing. And I started here a year ago, and one of the worst things I felt is the lack of complicity and the high, high compet competition between all the physicists, and principally by the professors. They want you to know everything and to work as hard as possible without caring for yourself. 
How do you think we can change this? How do you think you can talk to them and make them realize that this isn't fine? So are you talking about the professors making you work really hard and not worrying how it's affecting your emotional state? Not only the professors, like the really lack of complicity between everyone. I feel like when someone is really smart, they need to own the knowledge and not spread it. That's one of the things I felt the most. I'm not sure I understand. So um, you're trying to understand. So why don't you give me an example? <laughs> okay. Mm. Imagine like I have a friend and this friend is really good in, I don't know, uh, mechanics. And then he knows everything and he studies a lot. And when I ask for help, he says, okay, I'll help you later. And then he never helps just because he wants to have this for himself. Okay, now I understand that. So I, I can probably comment on that and you won't like it. <laughs> okay, um, I thought you were talking about people not worrying about the mental health of students, which is another important issue. But um, sorry about this, but you can't change that person. Yes, I know. Okay, yes. you got your data points. To me, working with people, management, it's all about data points. Okay, I've interacted with this person, I got them. Okay. What you can change is the way you react to that person. Why should you care? Okay, screw them, <laughs> but not really, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, so, you know, find someone else to work with. Find another way. You're gonna keep bump bumping your head against this and you're gonna lose. Another thing I talk about is when people send you negative energy, and that's pretty negative, like you are not worth it. You're not worth my time, right? He's basically telling you that. Any negative energy that they send to you, anybody sends to you, you have your choice to absorb it or to repel it. It's up to you. It's up to you how you react. So if someone comes at you, you're not worth helping, you're not smart, um, whatever it, it is, or you know, I think you did this wrong or whatever, you, you're welcome to take it in and decide if it's worth taking in for a little bit, or you might know the person already, you might know the circumstances, and just say, you know, one of my friends used to draw a circle and say, you're here, and everybody's throwing this negative energy at you. You can take it in if you want or not. Just repel it. And what I did when I was having a really hard time a few years ago, in about 2001 and 2002, I imagined this stuff, like these people that were really giving me a hard time, I imagined them as a little swirling negative energy thing. And I see them go, I'm just going to walk around there. Okay, we got it. And so these little techniques help you out. And you're not going to win this guy. Okay? And I think in a few years, he's going to feel bad that you won't work with him. <laughs> and how can we deal with the professors and our mental health? Oh, that, I just, that's what I thought you were asking at first. In the United States, that's a major problem right now. Um, one of the th things I did last year was review the physics and astronomy department at University of Pennsylvania. I knew it was a problem. This is an eminent university. And one of the problems they had is they, it was expensive to hire outside TAs because so many of their physics graduate students had gotten depressed and had a call in sick from teaching. And it came in, I was doing a review at uh, Cambridge University in the UK, and this is more and more and more common. So I think departments have to provide mental health support for the students. The world is just much more complicated now. It was complicated when I was a kid. It's harder now. And mental health is a real issue. And one of the things that I'm really fond of saying all the time is, you know, you can get, you know, your shoulder could get hurt, you can get the flu, you could get cancer, you can get bipolar, you can get depression. These are just different ways you can be ill. And mental illness is a real problem. And I, th and I think it's very important for all institutions to keep this in mind. We, we know the I know the statistics. So. Oi, ela vai traduzir para mim, no caso. 
Enquanto você estava mostrando os gráficos, eu fiquei curioso que você estava mostrando sobre o número de bacharelados total entre o ano de 1996 e 2001, se não me engano, teve o número de bacharelados de física estava caindo e de repente do nada ele começou a subir exponencialmente. Eu fiquei curioso para saber o motivo. É só uma questão de curiosidade mesmo, mas me atinu. So you were showing some data about um, people graduating in physics and comparing women to men and other genders. And he was talking about a drop that he saw in the overall majors between 96 and 2001. I was trying to, rem I was trying to remember that. Um. I think it's the previous one. Um, the, the majors, not the PhDs. This Bachelors, here. Bachelors, not the PhDs. Yeah, this one. I have an idea. I can't remember what the report said, but I got my PhD in um, back here. No, now I'm not sure. So around these years here, let, let me just put a conjecture, okay? Um, and I've, I have to go look at the report. Around these years in here was when I was looking for a job. I got my job at Bell Labs in um, 83, 84. I got my PhD in 84, but I started working before my PhD. Okay, so right here, I got my PhD. Um, I'm sorry. I left Bell Laboratories. I said that wrong. 92. Okay, here we go, right here. Now... Stop making fun of me. Now I remember, okay. The, the, I'm brushing the dust off my brain cells, okay. Um, so I left Bell Laboratories in 1992 to start at University of Illinois. There were no jobs, okay. And uh, one of the reasons there were no jobs was because the National Academy came out with a report that was wrong. They said they hired a lot of people in 1960 you know, after the war, and science was a big deal, and everything was doing great. And, but all these people that they hired in the early 60s and, uh, and late 50s were going to retire. And there was going to be a huge amount of jobs available for people that got PhD in STEM fields, except they didn't call them STEM at those times. What happened is that the department shrunk. The funding went down. U.S. funding really started, I mean, it really started to go down at those times. So the department shrunk. The funding wasn't available. So when I was out looking for a job, there were very few jobs out there. And I, I always felt it was a little unfair because coming out of Bell Laboratories with the resources I had, I was high on the list. Had I been a regular postdoc at Iowa State, which is a wonderful institution, I wouldn't have had so many publications and so many hits. So I was in a good situation. So I'm just telling you, what happened to me. But here, I believe that dip is because there really were so few jobs that people were not getting PhDs anymore. So I think that's it. But read the report. You can download it from there. I'm sorry to say we have to finish now. Um, as I mentioned, Laura is going to be here this afternoon. So if you have more questions, you can come back. You can stick around and talk to her now, too. But I wanted to ask another round of applause for her and say thank you, Laura. Thank you.